So it's my pleasure to start out this third day of the Congress by introducing Dr. Bjorn Nordstrom. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little worried for several reasons. First, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is not quite easy. Secondly, I don't know your background, but we'll do as good as possible. And I will uh, attach to what I said yesterday that there exists <clears throat> long distance transport, electrical transports in the body, which I call biologically closed electric circuits. And one specific circuit will be defined today. And I will also define how this circuit is powered. As I said yesterday, <clears throat> We consider the transport between blood and tissue today to be covered by diffusion over the capillary membranes, by differences in hydrostatic pressure as ultrafiltration, and by differences in colloid osmotic pressures over the, the membranes of the capillaries. <clears throat> These mechanisms are fairly inefficient sometimes. In the kidneys, the filtration is very efficient, but not so in many other organs. So there is a room for other long distance transport mechanisms, and the vascular interstitial closed electric circuits is one of these. And I don't think it's too um, impossible to consider that because we do have closed circuit systems at a smaller scale in the body over the, capillary, over, over the cellular membranes. They are well established since long time. The pumps, the ion pumps across the membranes. So why shouldn't nature also utilize the extremely efficient mechanism of transport by means of closed electric circuits. And I will show you that this is actually the case. <clears throat> um, I talked about the injury potential yesterday, but I will also talk today about another source of energy that can power the system I'm going to talk about. We'll make it very simple. We'll think about working with a muscle. The muscle gets tired after a while due to accumulation or production of lactic acid. This is something we all recognize. It's very simple. In that case, if you introduce an electrode into the working tiring muscle and another one in an adjacent resting muscle, you can record a, an electric potential difference a gradient, electrical gradient. This gradient is one out of the metabolic gradient that is produced by the action on the muscle. And actually, the gradient consists of as many as four different energy components. First is the chemical component, second the electric um, component, thirdly the volume pressure component, and fourth is the gravitational component. Of these components, which are all interrelated energy components, the electric is perhaps most easily recorded by an electrode in the muscle in relation to a non-working muscle. This energy difference is called metabolic polarization. And if I get to First slice now, please. <clears throat> I will again show you the really lower the light in the room. <clears throat> I will also remind you about the development of, of an injury potential. An injury potential in a tumor or 
after injury from a knife or chemicals produces essentially a similar thing as a metabolic polarization, potential, electric potential gradient, which here is indicated as negative in relation to surrounding non-injured tissue. Let us continue now <clears throat> to discuss the injury potential, how it develops. As you know, <clears throat> during hy hypoxia, if you have a blood pouring into the tumor here, it will be encapsulated from the main bloodstream and it will deplete its source of oxygen. You get a hypoxia inside the tumor and the hypoxic blood will degrade spontaneously. Hypoxic degradation. And that event is illustrated here at least one factor of the degradation of blood. If you take blood and protect it from the excess, the, the contact to oxygen, you will find that there are many reactions that take place. Here's one reaction which can be regarded as a proton pump that produces acidity which gives favorable condition for the next reaction to take part and this makes the reaction the condition favorable for the next and so, so on. We have sequences of reaction that start and continue like this, flow like this. We are not particularly interested here in the different reactions here but of the overall change which is produced by the spontaneous reaction during hypoxia. And that is a change from minus 0.5 volt to one plus 1.5 volt. That is 1.5 volts of change from in normal blood, sterile blood, when it spontaneously, spontaneously degrades. And 1.5 volts, that's a very large electric potential in biology. Now this reaction here is only one out of several reactions which hook on to each other. And many of these reactions are not known even today. But each reaction has its time constant. And each sequential set of reactions or cascade reactions have their time constant. And therefore you get the resultant potential change, next slide please, which can be shown as a fluctuating potential. But before I show that, I will just, just <clears throat> remind you about how we can record <clears throat> the injury potential in tumors I talked about yesterday. If you introduce an electrode, you can find here this corresponds to the lung. This is the edge of the tumor, interior edge of the tumor, lung, edge of the tumor, interior tumor, edge of the tumor, and lung, and so on. So you can see you have complexes of electropositive polarization of a tumor when it's degrading in the center in relation to surrounding tissue. In other cases, however, the electric potential may be electronegative in relation to surrounding lung, to so see here. And why is it so? Next slide. Let me come to the occurrence of the fluctuating potential in injury. In the beginning, an injured tissue is electropositive due to some of the reactions I showed, the cascade reactions I showed you before. But after a while, this potential changes in relation to surrounding non-injured tissue and becomes electronegative and then positive and negative. So the fluctuations here are attenuating and this is typical for any spontaneous process. This is a physical law. It acts like a pendulum that goes from one extreme to the other like this and finally stops in the middle. The degradation is a spon spontaneous process. It has to undergo such fluctuations. And this is the, represents the driving force of the circuitry I'm going to describe. 
it is drives the circuitry with an electropositive polarity in the beginning, then it becomes electronegative and so forth. And this is natural because in an injured tissue, you cannot expect to build up new tissue, repair tissue, with only the inflow of one type of ions. You ought to have both anions and cations. But they must come in certain sequences. And we must know how this curve proceeds to understand the process of healing. And that is a completely neglected fact to now, up to now, in attempts to heal tissue, in your tissue, for instance, with electricity. You can even, of course, counteract if you, in this phase, apply a negative potential. You cut off this and destroy the, the mm, circumstances for the healing. Now, I showed you <coughs> very small fluctuations or potentials in the two previous curves. And why is it so? That's depending on the fact that I can never know, really, in, in the beginning, in what phase of time I make the recordings. In an injury here, if I start to make the recording here, I will find no potential difference between the injured tissue and the surrounding tissue. Here I will get a positive potential, here I will get a negative, etc. That is the reason for the discrepancy I found in the beginning when I measured the electric potential in more than 100 cases. It was sometimes electronegative, sometimes electropositive, also in the same type of tumors. And this is the explanation for it. Now, this is a schematical representation. But how does it look in, in reality? This is part of work uh, we are doing. Uh, I have recorded here <coughs> the potential change in the fracture in a rat. The LI crest was crushed and an electrode was implanted and another one in the supplying vein. And in order to minimize the polarization products on the electrodes, I made very short recordings uh, every 50 minutes, day and night, day after day in the animals. And this represents the first part during the first 100 hours, and it represents a summation of about 500 deter separate determinations. And you see here basically a similar thing will occur. You have initi initially um, almost uh, uh, 170 millivolt potential in relation to the vein, and then it changes, becomes electronegative, positive, and negative, and so forth. In the process of healing, I should have recorded this about 10 or 14 days in a rut. But this is only uh, not, not as much as five days. So a lot of work remain. The technique of doing these things are, is not quite easy, and very time consuming, and it involves many technical difficulties. Next slide, please. <coughs> now, if you accept the concept of closed electric circuit, it will look like this. You may have an initial uh, phase of, a, of an injury, which is electric positive in relation to surrounding then electronegative uh, polarity. The vessels here they function, as I told you before, as electrically conducting uh, insulated cables because I have very carefully studied the electrical properties of the vessels, of the veins and the arteries. And they are highly resistive. They are, act like insulating sheets around the conducting medium of blood, which is the plasma. So this Polarized tissue is electrically connect, conduct, uh, connected to the plasma, which connects the non injured tissue to the level of the capillaries. Now, what is going on here? There is a thrombosis, of course. A blood clot, for instance, doesn't it obstruct the conductivity? No, it doesn't, because the 
thrombotic material is highly ionized tissue and very conductive. So it's not necessary with the flow of blood in the vessel. The blood clot is, is very good, um, a very good conductor for the current, ionic current, to the capillaries. At the level of capillaries, we do have connection over the capillary membranes to the interstitial tissue fluid among the cells. And this forms the internal communication that closes the vascular interstitial circuit. This seems quite sufficient maybe to you to begin with, uh, to function, because you do have the driving electromotive force and you have the closed circuit. So is in any battery it would function, but it doesn't function. It's incomplete. And what is incomplete? We have not defined the electrodes of the electrophoretic circuit. Because without electrodes and electrode reactions, redox reactions, no electrophoretic circuit will function. So then I had to hunt for the electrodes. And where could we find them? Well, reasonably, not in the bloodstream, of course, or in the tissue, tissue fluid, but at the interface between the blood and the interstitial tissue, and that is the endothelial cells of the capillaries. That is where we could suspect that they exist. And let, let us now look at the endothelial cells, their construction, and what we know about the endothelial cells. Then we find that each cell, this is an endothelial cell, and this is the interior of the bloodstream in the capillary, and this represents on both sides the, inter, the outside interstitial tissue fluid. The red lines here represent the, the electrode sites which we can assume to exist. And if you look at an illustration of how the cellular membranes look like, we'll find this here. Already in 1940, St. Georgi found that certain molecules in the body can act as electron transferring molecules. And on the basis of his work, Cole, for instance, Cope, many, they <clears throat> assume that in the cellular membranes, which are made up by bilayers of phospholipids, which are insulating materials, there are such molecules which can act as electrons transferring medias. So in the case of a superimposed gradient plus minus, there should be possible for an anodic reaction here, electron transfer and a cathodic reaction on the other side. This theory has then been elaborated by many others and <clears throat> we have here a set of different uh, 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 mo molecules, dehydrogenases, BC complexes, and cytochromes, cytochrome by Warber, and so forth, and Wieland, and uh, Kaling have worked on this. And it's now assumed that these complexes, they can transfer electrons from one side of the cellular membrane to the other in sequences like this. This is ubiquinone, which is very mob mobile, and access and carry between this and this, and this is cytochrome C that goes from this to this or directly to oxygen. This system here is part of the chemiosmotic theory of Peter Mitchell in England. And he worked for 25 years to convince the community medical community, that this circuit here, this electron transfer um, chain existed. And this is coupled to another circuit of ionic transport of a leaking pores in the membranes that completes the circuit, which then can be considered as a, as a short distance closed circuit. 
Next slide. We will have a look at how this is. This is a simple representation of the short circuit transport system of Peter Mitchell. He got the Nobel Prize. We gave him that for, well, a few years ago only. But he worked for 25 years. And nobody believed him. It was ridiculous, everything. He was crazy. But now it's accepted. This is his circuit. And you have here superimposed uh, gradient over the cellular membrane of the endothelial cell. Uh, electrons can then be transferred. This will be an anodic reaction here, electron transfer, a cathodic reaction. And that is coupled to the transport of ions in this direction. So we have a circuit. As long as these circuits exist, the long-distance transport circuit I am going to describe cannot function. We have also another factor to include here, and that is leaking pores, where we have transport of water and electrolytes from the bloodstream to the tissue by these leaking pores. But if we now, for a moment, assume that for some reasons this channel here is closed, and this channel is closed, then Peter Mitchell's circuit cannot function. But another function, another circuit, will be turned on. And that is the long distance transport circuit I'm going to describe. These channels now are closed. Consequently, there will be no transport of ions across the membranes, and there will be no transport across the leaking pores. Instead, you will get here in a superimposed gradient an induction of an anodic reaction, electron transport, a cathodic reaction. You get an ionic transport through the, the cell to the other side with a new anodic and new cathodic reaction, and they turn on a long distance transport. And of course, if you think for a while, this is probably a prerequisite for Peter Mitchell's transports because he, can, he must be able to explain the production of the gradient here. And that gradient of ions is built up by this circuit. So they work intermittently. Now, how can I know that these closes? And what closes them? I would put, put your attention to the existence of the matrix inside the cells. The matrix which contains very contractile uh, materials, is actin, which can contract the cells forcefully. And in fact, this happens when you expose a tissue to a superimposed field, you get very interesting reactions here, which you should look at now. Next slide. <coughs> here I placed <coughs> an electrode on the mesentery of a dog. This is an in vivo photograph. The other electrode is placed in the aorta. I use the supplying vessels of the mesentery between the aorta and the mesentery as a conducting cables. And here you can see, after a short while, there is a lot of bleeding, small spotlight be bleedings all over the mesentery. And if you look at this in detail, you will see here one of the spotlight bleedings. And adjacent to this, you can see here some very forcefully contracted capillaries. Some of them are even empty, as here. On the other hand, you can see the corresponding veins, which are here, they are partly blue and wide. And the blue material is caused by leukocytes, granulocytes, which accumulate in abundance in the, in the venous capillaries while the arterial are contracted. Next slide, please. Now, you cannot obtain these reactions on the capillaries with any kind of, with any level of of polar uh, potential. This is when the mesentery is electronegative and the aorta is electropositive. If you switch the polarity here, 
mass center is now electropositive and aorta electronegative, you see the same kind of reaction. The veins, they contain granulocytes while the arteries are empty. There are no blood cells in these. If you place your electrode reference, next slide, please. This is when I did the sa same, but used the vein, the, the, the caval vein as a reference. And here you can see clearly the empty capillaries here, the arterial capillaries, while the veins, they are rather wide and contain granulocytes. If you switch the to... Well, you see the granulocytes here. I have in my book, uh, you can find these pictures in my book where you have a, a scale, but you can recognize the size here because each dot here is a granulocyte. The exact measurement you can find in my book. I, sorry I didn't include it here in the slides. But here you can see empty arterial capillaries and the venous capillaries are filled with granulocytes. Now, this is not optimal at all because if we decrease the voltage to 100 millivolts, then we are within the limits of normal polarization of tissue. Next slide. <clears throat> Please, will you switch a little more rapidly? Then you can see here the increasing amount of the blue material and the still there are segmental uh, arterial capillaries which are empty and this is here in magnification of this part you've seen here. If you focus it you can see even the granulocytes and the almost empty arterial um, branch. It's quite clear that there are windows in biology where the tissue will function. And if you exceed voltages, uh, if there are too high voltages, you would turn off the biological functions. 10 volts will never show this, but 100 millivolts, yes. I don't know the lowest voltage, but you can see the reactions with local contraction of the arterial capillaries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what is now the reason for the occurrence of these reactions, which takes place segmentally on spots, not all over the mesentery? We can speculate about it, and I don't have the final answer. You can think about the nervous system of the capillaries, which is very extensive which um, uh, includes the veins and the arteries. But I will also focus your interest on this fellow here, which is a pericyte. The pericyte was discovered not too long ago by Zimmermann, and he showed that these cells, they are attached to the outer wall of the capillary membranes, like this here. And they have extensions like arms, and at the end of the arms they have some fingers, which seems to hook on to the outer surface of the capillaries. And these have a distribution on the arterial capillaries, which corresponds to the location of the segmental contractions. It might be a possibility that these are turned on by the superimposed electric field and transmit the energy to the capillary and produce local arterial contractions. There might be other explanations, but this is at least one way to put in this parasite into the biological system, because now we don't know anything about its function. It's an unanswered question. This could be the very important function of contraction of the capillaries. Next slide. What would happen then if the parasite is stimulated in some way to produce a local contraction of the arterial capillary? Or if some other function produces this contraction? Well, evidently there was no flow here, no blood cells. So the blood must be shunted away from the segmental contraction to the distal part of the capillary, to the shadow of the segment of contraction. And in the case of a superimposed field, charged material could then 
enter the tissue by the leaking pores I showed you before. Still, these contracted capillaries will retain their capacity of acting as electrodes with the enzyme system they have in the, embedded in their plasma membrane. So there will be one function here, the electrode function can be effective here, and the ionic transport here. This is a long distance transport system which is probably acting intermittently with its function of the, over the cellular membranes of uh, Peter Mitchell has described. <clears throat> now, how is it possible to activate the electrodes here? What is the minimum required energy? Because in any electrode system, you have an activation energy that has to be ex uh, exceeded before any reaction can take place. An enormous system as a saline solution with electrodes, platinum electrodes, you have to exceed 1.6 volts, which is the equilibrium potential between platinum and saline solution, before any current can flow. And that would jeopardize all long distance transport, of course, because we cannot think of a biological system which require at least 1.6 volts to be activated. Now, we do have a few things to consider here, and that is, what is the effect of contraction? We know that the vessels, I have in many ways shown that they act as conducting uh, relatively insulating cables, and if you contract this in some way, a current flowing here will increase its density within the, within the contracted area. At the same time, in this capillary, the electrodes or the globular enzymes in the cellular membranes, they have a very, very small surface area facing the bloodstream, which means that there will be an enhancement of the electric field against these, and that will produce F uh, favorable conditions for activation of these electrodes. And how that can be explained, I will show you on the next slides, please. Next. <clears throat> here I show you the system. It is a macroscopic system, of course. I have here a tray with, which contains, uh, these should hang together here. Uh, there is a platinum electrode. Here is in the tray the uh, barrier of silicone embedded uh, platinum strings, so we have very small surfaces here compared to this large surface area. Then you have here um, plasma, blood plasma, and on the other side also blood plasma, which continues here, and you have another barrier here with these strings, and blood plasma and this electrode. Now, with this system, I can make this electronegative and this electropositive, and we'll see what happens in the tray here. Next slide. Then you can see production of gas at the electrode surfaces. This is anodic reaction with formation of bubbles of oxygen and chlorine, and also protons are produced which partly precipitate the protein in the plasma as a brown uh, line here. But look here what happens. With the same current flowing through this surface here of the large electrode, you have a tremendous, an abundance of gas production at this little surface area here, at each of them. And the current goes through this electrode to the other, and you have another reaction here, another here, and another here. So you get here a nordic reaction, a cathodic reaction, then an anodic reaction here you don't see, and a cathodic reaction, a nordic reaction, a cathodic reaction. This shows that there are other reactions taking place in the, in the blood, in the plasma, than in saline solution. Because if I had saline solution, the same amount of bubbles would be produced here as a summation of the bubbles here. 
But in the case of a biologic material like plasma, you can activate other redox reactions which are responsible for the flow of current over these, these uh, electrode surfaces then are produced here. Of course, here we have the electric field that will be enhanced. It will be focused like this here and focused here. You have a very high intensity of activation at these very small surface areas. And that is the reason why you get this picture. And that is one of the possibilities that can explain that we can activate the biological redox systems at very low voltages. Theoretically, but what happens in reality, we must try that. And that is one of the things Peter Mitchell could not show because it was not easy to work on cellular membranes to determine the activation energy at these small molecules. It's almost impossible. Now, if you accept my system of long distance transport, we can test that system and that will be included in the test of Peter Mitchell's system. Next slide. In order to do so, I took an anesthetized pig. <clears throat> this is a stomach, of course, with a large electrode, 180 square meter surface area on the platinum electrode. And this has the same size, and this is the same size in the aorta, in the cava, and one in each of the ureters which were placed uh, on the abdomen of the operated animal. Now, the first step in the experiment was to determine the potential difference between this electrode and this electrode, and this, and this, and this, and this, and so forth, cross, crisscross like this. And they gave the following, I hope you can see it, in spite of this box here. If I use the stomach as a reference, the cable vein showed potential differences of plus 269 millivolts. If I then <coughs> made a reversal, I, I took, made the stomach electropositive in the outlet of my recording instrument, I get 260, minus 260 millivolts. It corresponds very well. Um, then I continued to do this measurement. Stomach aorta, for instance, corresponds to this value, 318 plus, and this is minus 309, and so forth. In this way, I made all the recordings, two recordings of the system, and you get one set of recordings to the right and one to the left. And the potential differences here are not remarkable at all. Of course, this is acidic surrounding compared to the aorta. There must be an electric potential difference. Okay. And we could find <coughs> very small difference in potential. For instance, here, 3 millivolt between right ureter and left ureter. What was remarkable was the second part of the experiment. When I took this electrode and short-circuited it over the, this electrode and this electrode and so forth, over a sensitive galvanometer, in each case I could record a flow of current which had to pass from this electrode over the capillaries in the wall of the stomach to the bloodstream and so on, all the way down to the urine that shows the conductive capacity of the tissues. They are all interconnected in the body. And this is a fundamental and important thing that can open up possibility to explain many things, also, also in acupuncture. It was remarkable to see that even as small differences, the three millivolts, could allow current in microamps to pass between the electrodes. That shows that the system is very sensitive to differences, potential. We have all the time metabolic potential difference. When we work with the muscle, when the liver starts to work after meal, etc., that polarizes the organ in relation to surrounding and starts a flow of current in order to equalize 
the situation and restore homostasis. Next slide. Now, if we assume that these electrodes exist in the capillary membranes and the uh, histologists and ultra microscopists, they, they, they are convinced that this is the case, we can see <coughs> certain interesting details in electron micrographs. And why should we do that? In the case, assume that the electrodes exist in the membranes of the endothelial cells. And these are integrated in a system for mass transport on the basis of electrophoresis. We should be able to have some traces of electrode reaction products which must occur at the surfaces of these electrodes. Well, if you look at this rat uh, capillary, you see a box here which is enlarged here. You can see certain interesting details. Outside the capillary you see something that is called the basement membrane. It's an amorphous material adjacent to the surface of the capillary. Secondly, you can see here rounded bodies inside the cell. And some of these have the shape of omega shape, like bottles. They have a broad attachment to the, to the uh, surface, and they open up like this here. But when they're inside, they are rounded. They are sometimes collected on one side, sometimes on the other side. No one has been able to explain the occurrence or the development of these so-called vesicles. They are called pinocytes, when they assume to contain water. But they are also found, for instance, in nerve endings as vesicles containing different uh, materials for the activation of the muscles, at muscle contraction. Now, these structures have not been described uh, in terms of how they develop, how they move, how they can move across the cells, and how they are consumed. There are very complex explanations that they form like bottles and they move and some, in some way they are filled, packed with material and they go to the other side of the membrane and then they open up a little sector and open up the cell membrane and squeeze out the content, etc. Very complex, unexplained theories. Next slide. If we assume that they are partly, at least, a result of reaction products at electrode surfaces, we should be able to demonstrate in models how that could happen. And that's what I'm doing here. We produce then a matrix by blood, using blood. I centrifuge heparinized blood, which means that we have an excess of cell bodies which carry a surplus of fixed electronegative charges. And that mimics the tissue matrix and the matrix inside the cells. If you now apply voltage to the electrode here, and to another electrode on the other side, you can see the development of a circular body like this. And it will move out like this and stretch and form a more, a more, an omega-shaped structure. You see here. And extends here. Next slide. And it's stretched and leaves and goes out to the other side. The transport function is a function of dielectric transport due to the charge of the matrix under the influence of the superimposed electric field. These are well-known, well-founded principles. You can also see that optical, at least, we can see something that looks like a membrane here, a double membrane. And this membrane has the same thickness irrespective of the size of the bubbles. And this is an interface 
rearrangement of the molecules of the content in relation to the outer phase. That's an interfacial reaction. The molecules have to orient themselves, and optically that is reveals, revealed by the appearance of a membrane-like structure. Next slide. The movement of these structures in the cells are due to the matrix in the cell. This is a leukocyte uh, with its matrix. You see here a skeleton which has been this. I have not done this. This is from a, another work. But you can see how it looks like in the cell. And they are arranged, these strings, in the following way. This is cross sections and this is a length sequence, sections. And we can duplicate this in the morphologic scale. Next slide. By using cotton wool, which acts exactly as the matrix of the body. Because cotton wool uh, contains fibers which are provided with a surplus of fixed electronegative charges, as any tissue in the body. If you compress it and apply a current here between this electrode and another an electronegative electrode, you can see formation of bubbles, and these bubbles are transported, as you see here, in the matrix due to the electric field and the presence of these fibers, charged fibers. Next slide, please. Now, in the capillary bed, we have the basement membrane outside the cells. It's unexplained. We have the surface facing the bloodstream. There is another layer, which is called the plasmatic zone, which contains one mobile and one fixed layer. And these are unexplained. These could very well be also produced by electron reaction products. Because here, if you do make the following experiment with plasma, you can find the formation of structures adjacent to an electrode. And you wash this away, you can see you get something that looks like a membrane. Like this. Next slide. <clears throat> I don't say that this is the explanation, but I should be able to indicate at least some some indications of the presence of electrode reaction products, and that's what I've been doing here. In reality, of course, the production and the, the development of vesicles, the content of the vesicles, and the, the formation of the plasmatic zone and the basement membrane may are, of course, complex. The field will, in some way, induce contraction of these. You have seen the contractions. And these contractions are accompanied by the accumulation of leukocytes in the non-contracted area. At the same time, you have seen also that it's possible to explain that bubbles like vesicles can be produced as electrode reactions inside the cell and you can also perhaps explain the presence of the basement membrane and the plasmatic zone at the outside of the cells. These are things I also <clears throat> discussed in my book. There's only one thing I would like to, to correct now. When I wrote the book, I attached my theory to the prevailing opinion that the vesicles they empty themselves into the interstitial tissue. But I don't believe that is the truth. They disappear by a second electrode reaction at the surface, inner surface of the cells. Next slide. I would like to conclude this by <coughs> showing an example of the contraction of the arterial capillaries which is accompanied by the accumulation of granulocytes in the shadow of this suspended flow. And what can that mean? This could be the opening of an explanation for the accumulation of leukocytes in injured tissue. Today, we, we speak about leukotaxis. As I told you yesterday, it's in just one word. 
doesn't mean anything, doesn't say anything about the mechanism of, of accumulation. In my opinion, the electronegatively charged particles of the, which are the leukocytes, they are electrophoretically transported in the circuit to the site where the tissue is electropositive, just by simple electrophoresis. That could explain uh, in an energetic uh, um, the energetics and the mechanism of, uh, of, of accumulation, which is not possible today. Next slide, please. In the following way, you can see here, for instance, the formation of vesicles, the formation of basement membrane of the plasmatic zone. You can also see how the, the ne electronegative leukocytes accumulate, and they can leak through the open leaking pores through the venous capillary into the tissue this way. Uh, can I get lights, please? <clears throat> I've tried to describe this circuitry, uh, which I have tested in many ways. I have several lectures which test the vali validity of the, uh, the function of that will lead too far. I think uh, we will stop here and uh, leave you to give questions. And I will try, if I can, to answer the questions. I admit that this is not very simple. But that's not my fault. Nature is complex. <laughs> okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
the body needs to function on. Well, I tried to explain that with my secretary here, that all tissues in the body are electrically interconnected in the closed circuit system. And the very important point is that one, at least one channel is insulated, mm -hmm. that the loss a flow or current. Mm -hmm. If the vessel walls were not insulated relatively, there shouldn't be possibilities for any flow or current. Mm -hmm. That forms one insulated branch that's connected to the other one. If you have two cables, at least one must be insulated from the surrounding to let the current to flow. And that is what we have in the body. And the current I sh showed here in the pig experiment was very small, say microampers, which you think are very, very small currents, but in fact they are large currents in a biological situation. And after all, it's not the current density itself, it's the amount of current that flows over a period of time that counts. The coulombs that is transferred, that's important. And if you also have very small currents flowing, if there are a lot of flow for a long time, that means tremendous mass transports. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the reason I was asking these questions initially is that in dentistry where we have fillings in the mouth and we measure the currents that are potentials in the mouth there in millivolts or microampertures or in micro <coughs> or in uh, nanowatt seconds even. Um, well, now you are, you are a dentist, I can understand. Yes. And <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, mistakes or, or misinterpretations uh, 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 in this field. For instance, if you take an instrument, two electrodes, and place one electrode on a filling, another one on another filling, uh, you, are like, you, are, you must have a current to flow because you have the conducting saliva and you have your insulated recording circuit. Mm -hmm. That forms a closed circuit. But when you take away your recording device, it doesn't mean that you have a flow or current between the two, uh, two, two metals because you must have a closed circuit. And that circuit can be formed in the following way. I have included that in the chapter 18 in my book, a short, a short uh, <laughs> description of how current can flow in, in, uh, between uh, fillings in, in, in teeth, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. I'll see if I can r r explain it. If you have here one tooth, and here's another one, and there is a filling here, and there's another one here. Say this is an amalgam of some kind, and this is gold, or different metals. If you measure here, the recording here, and you have here the saliva, and you have contact between these metals and the saliva, there will be a flow or current, of course. When you take this away, it's not necessarily so that there is flow or current, because it's not a closed circuit, but if you have a communication here to the pulpa, for instance, between this metal, and you have vessels here, and the vessels in the jaw join this, and there is a coincidence or connection between this here and this here, a current will flow. Equally, if you have a pocket here in the, what do you call it, uh, uh, in the gingiva, yeah. Yeah. and you have a degrading process here, uh, an injury, very poor gum here, and one here. That could be also a communication between the vessels here, this is highly ionized tissue, and the other one. There are different combinations here, but you must always think in terms of closed circuits. And this is roughly outlined in chapter 18 of my book. Very I wasn't particularly interested in, in that when I wrote the book, but I, I mentioned it at least. Uh, is there any, uh, I'm Oscar Janiger, I'm a physician. Is there any evidence, uh, what is the evidence for these events occurring in central nervous system tissue? Do we have any uh, information on that? Which events? The, uh, the mechanism of uh, in current of injury 
and the, uh, the possibility of uh, intercommunication of electrical events in the brain that would mirror some of the things that you had mentioned here. <clears throat> well, this is another very big question, of course. <clears throat> Let me speak about the peripheral nervous system briefly. We have theories about how impulses are transmitted in the nerves. And the nervous transmission is not a mass transport system as I have described here and Peter Mitchell has described. The ECG is not a mass transport, it's a signaling system. But still, the vascular interstitial closed circuit I described is involved in that system because the nerve cell is immersed in interstitial tissue fluid as well as a muscle cell and the interstitial tissue fluid on the both sides are also connected to the capillaries and to the bloodstream so you virtually have an external grounding of the nerve transmission system over this circuit. And that was not considered when the theory of the saltatory circuits along the nerves was formed. And I think it's time now to make a re revision of, the, uh, of the, the, um, this uh, principle of, of the transport of, of nervous impulses in peripheral nerves. In the central nervous system, similar things can be uh, also anticipated to occur. We have there, for instance, instead of the ordinary interstitial tissue fluid, we have the cerebrospinal fluid, which is equally conducting also as a plasma. And it's interesting to notice that if you consider the pulses that goes from a nerve cell body along the axon to the synapses of a muscle fiber, have an extremely high resistance because of their very minute diameter. And the specific resistivity of the axon, the axolemma, is about the same as the resistivity of plasma of the blood. But the blood vessels, they form very, very wide channels with low resistivity. So the lowest resistivity uh, is uh, uh, provided by the vascular system. And that must be considered in the future, but it will take a long, a long time because the neurophysiologists in the world, they have lived with a lie for their whole life and they cannot give it up immediately. <laughs> Did I ask you, answer your question? Yes. In part, you did, yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Nordenstrom. In special regard to what you have just been mentioning, yes. is there any peculiar or special nature of the exchange between the nervous and vascular system at the blood-brain barrier? I don't know. I have not studied that. Hmm. Yes, Dr. Nordenstrom. Yes. Um, you've uh, mentioned these electrical circuits between different parts of the body occurring in responses perhaps to the healing processes and yes. that kind of thing. Now in, in life um, I have often heard and I think perhaps other people here have often heard of people experiencing movements on which they describe as streamings or perhaps even a, a feeling of electricity, movements in a coordinated fashion, perhaps <laughs> up the back, over the head, down over the surface of the body, and other movements acting over long distances in coordinated ways. <clears throat> um, and I wonder there are other things, for example, some people uh, claiming that they feel um, sensations such as that kind in the hands or in the feet Thanks. and yeah. that kind of thing. And I'm wondering whether um, your uh, 
uh, hypothesis or theory can help explain. Uh, well, you touched upon something I thought about myself many times. It's difficult to prove anything, but uh, <coughs> I th think you are on the right track. Because particularly aging persons, they claim that they find something, a very intense pain, pain, for instance, under their foot in a certain spot for a short time period, and then it disappears. They can find something itching on <coughs> a certain place of the body, and that goes away spontaneously, etc. And of course, such events could very well be the cause of electric currents in the body between polarizing regions. You, they could have charged up their battery of the liver or some, some other organs that suddenly exceeds its capacity and there will be a leak somewhere. It could be anywhere. And that could produce reactions. Yes. This is a possibility. It's uh, too much of philo philosophy so far, but it should be thought about and it should be investigated, of course. But I think you are on the right track. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Nordenstrom, <coughs> yes? you described uh, basically a process oh. of, of electrolysis. Yes. Now, I would like to ask what kind of other ions except the protons are displaced following this process? Which In are treatment, you mean? Yes. Wow. Which consequences does <coughs> it have for the pH of the tissue targeted and of the surrounding tissue? And if uh, intracellular in the targeted tissue, like the tumor, there are produced superoxides? Yeah. Uh, when you use <coughs> platinum electrodes, first you have to exceed the equilibrium potential, uh, which is in saline solution, 1.6 volts then the current will flow. In tissue, you can activate the system at much lower voltage as shown here. Some of the activation will be, will produce protons at the anodic site and drive the acidity to pH 2. And the protons, as they are charged, we move from the anode outward and precipitate all the proteins and destroy them. There will be a completely killing of all the living material within the proton front. But the protons are, are uh, counteracted by the buffering capacity of the tissue fluids. And the capacity of buffering is tremendous in tissue. It fills on all the time. That's the reason why we have a very sharp front, a very, very narrow edge, where you have complete destruction and normal tissue. And that can be utilized for therapy, for instance, perhaps in the future, in combating brain tumors. Uh, beside protons, you have, of course, production of gas at the electrode and the node. You have oxygen and chlorine. The chlorine will diffuse and bleach the central of the destroyed tissue. There are many other reactions also taking place, which you don't see directly, but which take place in a biologic surrounding. Otherwise, I couldn't explain the discrepancy of gas formation that the electrodes in the in, the, the in vitro uh, example I gave you here. On the cathodic side, <coughs> you have production of hydroxic ion which will drive the pH down up to 12, but the tissue tolerate that much better than the acidic surrounding. And of course, hydrogen gas will be formed and twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. Dr. Nordstrom, I'm a dentist. I measure microamperes and millivolts from the tooth to the adjacent mucosa gum tissue. Mm -hmm. Most of the readings that I get are of a negative value. In the United States, we feel that the negatively charged fillings are more of a detriment to the patient than the positively charged fillings, although there seems to be no basis <coughs> for that that I know of, and it's not that way in Europe. Do you have any feelings why this might be the case? Well, you have always a potential between the metal and surrounding. You can measure it, determine it as a, a normal potential in relation to the a normal hydrogen electrode, for instance. But in vivo, you must relate it to some other <coughs> references, for instance, blood. 
This is one way to do it. And um, different metals have different normal potentials, of course. But this is a stable uh, you, you may also have different potentials in one and the same metal. Yes. If you measure different parts of an, of an amalgam, for instance, you will find potential difference between these. They are relatively anodic and relatively cathodic areas. And that can produce corrosion and dissolution of metal and the liberation, for instance, of, um, of um, um, mercury that is resorbed. And there has been a lot said about the possibility of intoxication by mercury in that way. I have no particular opinion myself concerning this, but this is a process which must, we must consider. It will happen, and it happens in many, many um, fillings. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a very good metal, as for instance gold or platinum or something, noble metal, you have always a normal potential also between these metals and tissue. But the point is now that you can have potential differences which are based mainly on what happens in the tissue. If you get an infection, for instance, you get a tremendous polarization of that tissue in relation then to your metal. And if you can map the pathway of current, you can understand that there will be current flowing. And the way to treat that um, problem when the patient has pain due to the flow of current, can be tremendous pain in that way, in that case, you should try to combat the infection. And when that heals and the pathway for current are blocked, then the pain will disappear. Mm -hmm. But there are many combinations here, as you see. Different metals, inhomogeneous homo, homo, metals, and uh, infections, etc. Mm -hmm. And the, there is often conductive pathway between the uh, filling and the pulpa with its vessels that ca can extern make the external connection to another metal in the other side of the jaw. It closes the circuit together with the saliva. Okay? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nordenstrom. Yes? One of the uh, mysteries concerning uh, biological control systems in the body has been the hyperpnea of exercise. That is, uh, that the response to exercise of the respiratory system involving an increase of uh, breathing rate occurs at a faster, at, at a shorter time lapse than can be uh, described by the known control paths. And I wonder if you have devoted some thought to um, how your theories and your, uh, your findings uh, would affect uh, the interpretations that we have concerning the, just the normal control systems of the body. This has been a mystery for a long time. We are <coughs> entering respiratory physiology here. And uh, of course, um, that requires a lot of consideration concerning the normal uh, stimulation of respiration, etc., control, the central res control respiration, and so forth, and that can be influenced in many ways. Uh, all people, for instance, with arteriosclerosis, they um, have a poor circulation in the brain. They must sit up in bed, and they, and they must be stimulated to sleep. They must have strong coffee to increase the circulation in the brain then they can sleep, otherwise they wake up. Well, this is so complex, I don't think we can go into it. No. Um, Dr. Nor uh, Bjorn Nordstrom, I might like to respond a little bit to the exercise. Um, I want to ask you a question concerning the lymphatic system and how it relates to the closed circuit. Um, but I am a lymphologist. I'm C. Samuel West from Orem, Utah. And um, Dr. Jack Shields in California, and, and this might be, um, everybody might like to meet him or know about him. 
He has photographed the thoracic duct for the first time in the history of the world, and I was in Italy in 1979 when he showed this film. And the lymphatic system, of course, is what pulls the dead cells and the poisons out and so forth and neutralizes them, and they come up through the lymph nodes. And before it comes up the thoracic duct, why it comes up as completely neutralized before it dumps back into the subclavian vein at the base of the neck. But the big debate in 1979 is what activated that lymphatic system. They had a person walking, and there was no movement. But we had to take a, a person had a deep breath like this. Right there. At the peak of inhalation, the lymph shot into the bloodstream just like a geyser, just like an oil well. And Dr. Jack Shield jumped up out of his chair and he says, there it goes, there it goes. And that put an end to the, to the debate on what actively activates the lymphatic system. Dr. Dr. Zelikowski from Israel has also proven that the mini trampoline, which we sent to him, when he did, it took him two years to do the research, that moving up and down on the mini trampoline activates the lymphatic system. And of course, it's a lymphatic system that fights poisons and, and infections and things of this nature. And so it's actively known that you do that. And something that works right along with this is that the light, fast stroke by Dr. Olszewski from Poland has proven activates the lymphatic system. That's when you hurt yourself, you grab and rub. And we have more on this. But what I want to ask uh, here is when, as a lymphologist, we know that when a cell's damaged, it puts off poisons, and it dilates the blood capillaries, and that's the albumin come out with the water, and it produces the excess fluid around the cells. In that condition, the white blood cells can't work. Dr. Bjorn Nordstrom, as you do your research, and the water is removed through putting the positive electrode down and the negative electrode outside in the tissues and remove the water, yes. uh, does this have an effect to accelerate the ability of the white blood cells then to attack the cancer cell at that point? Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's difficult to answer that question because <clears throat> there are so many factors in, involved in the transport. I will first uh, add something to what you say about the, the uh, emptying of the lymphatic system. As I'm a professor of radiology, I worked all my life with circulation and respiration. I was former the chief of the Department of Thoracic Radiology at Karolinska Hospital. <clears throat> I have made filming of the sequence of emptying of the thoracic duct into the subclavian vein. And that takes place synchronously with respiration. During inhalation, uh, there is a stretching of the lymphatics in the mediastinum and the milking out of the contact to the subclavia. During exhalation, the kink and fill, and so it goes syn synchronously. So the mechanical pumping or the respiration uh, is responsible for the emptying of the, of the stream of lymphatic fluid in the lymphatic duct. Now, to the ne next question about the influence of dehydration. Uh, that changes, for instance, conductivity tremendously. I measured conductivity change by dehydration. And, uh, for instance, the transmission of ECG pulses are chained in the area of dehydration. And there are many complex things happening, but I cannot give you a proper answer on your specific question. Can I um, maybe suggest here that um, we have research that shows that in order for the white blood cells to work, they have to have the close contact of the cell. And that when there's excess fluid and lack of oxygen at the cell level, then the immune system falls down. And um, in order for the, so it would seem that with what we have, with what you're doing, I want you to know that uh, I am one person who is going to be dedicated to help make you famous forever. <laughs> because I have, I have been working with this research for 12 years now. I've lectured in about 200 cities a year, all over the United States. But your research, I want to give recognition to you and let you know that I believe with all my heart that when they published the Discovery Magazine, and they called it the Electric Man, uh, I've been praying for 10 years for this because all I've had to quote up until now is research I could find in 1962 published under electricity and plants. And I've said for years, if they ever published that the body's electrical, that they find even that the life process in every cell generates an electrical field, that everything is energy, you ask two questions. What turns the generators off and what turns them on? You find the answer to those two questions. You've got the answer to every disease known to man. And Dr. Nordstrom, I predict that you're going to be well known 
and famous forever for the research you've done. I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, maybe another time when we meet, I can show you some other material I have. For instance, how it's possible to blow life in a piece of dead tissue. I have it here in my... <laughs> Shall I show just a few slides? Yes, yes. Okay, I can only show you a few, few glimpses of an experiment. <clears throat> in this case, I have... No, please. Remain. This one should remain. Fine. And sharpen it. Focus it, please. Now I need the pointer. Okay. This is a fat specimen of a breast from a breast cancer. No, don't move this. So please. And I have here placed two electrodes with small protrusions in order to produce edge enhancement. You can see in the radiograph some structures are present before any treatment of the specimen. Why do you, oh, you, please, yes. I applied here as much as 10 volts between the electrodes, and after 10 coulombs, you can see there is something happening inside the specimen. Uh, there are structures close to this, no, please, no, please. There are structures here close to the cathodic area, which are fairly bl blunt, uh, rough, and they go up this way, and they continue here to other structures, which are more cloudy, and the, you can may see here. No. Oh, okay. Look here, you can see small points, and they could be microcalcifications. We will pay attention to this later on. Now, you see that there has happened something as a result of the flow of current. Definitely, this is the same specimen. Now we can look at the histology here by cutting the whole specimen and follow the, these structures, how they developed in the specimen. Next slide then. And this is the cathodic area, electronegative. You see here fibrous material corresponding to the blunt uh, or the th thick uh, structures. And these are of collagenous nature. And there is no fibroblasts here. And pathologists, they believe that the fibroblasts produce fibrotic tissue, but this is not true. It's only in the anodic area you can find numerous amounts of large amounts of of fibroblasts in the tissue. And this tissue is more irregular. It has another appearance than the cathodic tissue. This is electronegative side, electropositive side. Next slide. <clears throat> and here, if you focus this, you can see more close up of the collagenous material. This looks like a stretched uh, net, and they are smooth surfaces, and you can never see any fibroblasts in that half of the specimen. In the other half of the specimen, you see a more irregular fibrous material of, of, of elastic type with a lot of fibroblasts. Next slide. <clears throat> in spontaneously developed fibrosis around cancer of the breast fat tissue, you can see remnants of something similar to the stretched ne mesh of collagenous material as here. And also in other places, more irregular material with fibroblast. And this is due to the development of the fluctuating potential in degrading processes. And therefore, you can find regions with dominantly anodic fibrosis and cathodic fibrosis. Next slide. <clears throat> the cathodic fibrosis develops inside the fat cells. You see here, for instance, this is half transformed with the reticulum inside. And you can see here, this is filled with this reticulum. And this reticulum then dissolves, like this, 
and forms thick membranes which thicken and leave a cleft-like structure like this and nowhere you can find a single fibroblast in that half of the specimen. Next slide. The anodic fibrous tissue, however, contains large amounts of fibroblasts and this material develops in the interstitial tissue uh, the spaces, as you see here, they start to develop, grow out in, from that part of the fat tissue. Next slide. Now, well, this is to explain uh, something which develops in tissue, but continue with this. We, we can't take time with it. These are microcalcification in the center. Please continue. I'll show you. Please continue. More. More? We see the. Yeah, here. In this case, I have again a fat specimen in between these two electrodes before any current is allowed to flow. After the flow current, this was made positive. You can see here some new structures com coming in here, and there are small dots. And I thought these were microcalcifications, which you often see in breast cancer, as you know. However, when you cut it and look at these structures, you find they look like bushes sitting on the cellular membranes like this here. And these are due to birefringent material and form a matrix. And they don't produce any calcifications. And the calcium here, if you stain with calcium, there is no calcium. And there shouldn't be any calcium because this is produced here in the acidic area, in like the positive environment, so no calcium can precipitate there. So when you see this here, you change the polarity. Next slide. And then you can see the precipitation of typical microcalcification. This is a hematoxylene eosine. Next slide. This is a specific for the calcium ion. You can see here the <coughs> currents of microcalcifications. Um, Lights, please. <clears throat> this is only one example. I have a one-hour lecture on transformations of various cells as a normal lung tissue from rats compared with other normal tissues from liver, from fat, etc. And you can get tremendous changes in the appearance of the cells, particularly at the influence of very small amounts of current. Um, currents down to one milli microamp, microamps below my, that, you get big, big uh, aggregates of, of, of cells. For instance, you sub subject the blood to, to microamp currents, you form large conglomerates of cellular-like structures which are 100 mu in diameter. And you can also get cells which look like cancerous cells. Well, this was a very, yes. very brief uh, yes. uh, demonstration of something yes. that should take longer time and be presented in another way. Yes. Do you have uh, any questions? Yes. Um, Dr. Nordenstrom? Yes. yes. Um, Yesterday's lecture, before yours, there was somebody who gave a lecture, a dentist, who um, spoke actually about the occurrence of foci in the teeth, as well as in other parts of the body. But um, <coughs> this, and, and your lecture made me wonder. She was quite, I think, opposed to the idea of the use of uh, root canal treatment, in which as you know, bits of metal are used to replace the nerves of teeth. Yes. In view of your own uh, experiences, would you say that these would pose problems by creating localized uh, tissue injury and the insertion of these metal wires? Would you say that that was a problem? They can cause a lot of troubles, of course, yes. because you will induce uh, corrosion. And corrosion means flow of current that can take place in different parts of the root, uh, the, the metal inserted into the root, or between that metal and some other uh, metals. And um, 
um, I don't know what, I didn't listen to her yes, lecture. Yes. But you, you could see that it could raise problems. That's just what happened. Oh, happens. certainly, yes. yes. We right. have uh, the same problem in the hip nails, for instance. Yes. And many radio radiologists um, uh, don't know that the corrosion can occur uh, at the presence of a hip nail. I was recently invited to, to Wisconsin to speak to many uh, orthopedic surgeons and many of them didn't know that they were not supposed to use a hammer to bang in a, 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 a nail into the tissue Joint. because you destroy the matrix of the, the lattice of the metal and polarize it. You can produce an injury to the metal which then will become anodic in relation to other parts and that starts currents with the electronic transfer between the sites in the metal and it's closed in the tissue fluid outside. And the results in the dissolution of metal at the anodic site, which you can see also in radiographs. Yes. So there might be problems with other prostheses as well, such as oh, yeah. pacemakers oh, and so The other question that relates a bit to the things related to the wind there's another series of phenomena that has been known for a long time amongst uh, folk people is that women during menstruation often um, undergo, um, have serious, have other problems. I mean, trivial ones might be uh, uh, they find it difficult to have permanent waves or uh, uh, they were not in the old days allowed to go into the cheese uh, building because they would affect the bacteria cultures that have to do with cheese. Uh, also, they're said if they hold cut flowers in their hands, these flowers would uh, fade faster and so on. Uh, your mention of I'd like to hear the comments of the women now. Yeah, well... <laughs> I, I, I don't particularly, well, I, I don't particularly personally relate it to menstruation. I would rather <laughs> relate it to their uh, depressed feelings at this time, which of course can happen to a man as well. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering whether these, uh, this collection of phenomena might be related in a sense to changes in electrical fields at these times. In relation well, basically, these uh, changes are related to the changes in the hormonal status. Yes. And that uh, changes a lot of the electrolytes and the water content in the body. It's well known, for instance, that the weight of the women increases in the premenstrual state, and that can be rather uh, significant. For instance, I myself seen women who get even spontaneous pneum pneumothorax, rupture of the lung, due to uh, the fact that the lung have too much of water and the, uh, they are more rigid and not that pliable as before. So a simple cough or something like that will rupture an emphysematous blab and they get a collapse of the lung. That can happen over and over in the premenstrual phase in certain women. Oh, um, and uh, th now there are many things happening in yeah. women we don't know anything about. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Nordenstrom, yes. yes. One last question, sorry. Uh, would you say, I, I would say, for example, that most of the people who are here somehow have a feeling, have had a feeling, in our case it's mostly intuitive, that the body is, was an electrical type of system. I mean, we have yeah. no experience except our own bodies. Some of us may have had the special experiences. Yes. Would you, would you say about yourself that you had some interest or special interest in that direction before your work appeared, which drove you, in <coughs> fact, to do that work? I can tell you I didn't have. It's a, just a result of a systematic search. Yes. <coughs> because I started to observe structures around cancers the corona structures we have described, 13 different elements can be described, and I wanted to know why and how and when they developed. Therefore, I started systematically to study the different possibilities and I arrived to the conclusion it has to be closed circuit. And then I explored that further and found the vascular interstitial closed electric circuit.
Thank you. So you had no special interest in electricity before no. that? No. Not at Thank all. you very much. Thank you very much. I think this is, uh, this is time now to conclude because they want to remove that wall and they want us to leave the room. And I thank you for being patient and stay so long time with you. Thank you.